right, we're going to reconvene. We're at uh, Central Services. Oh, so Stuart, you're back. I'm back. So in Central Services, we don't have an, a slide presentation because there's not really any functions that Central Services does. This is the area where we capture all of those items that are not well captured elsewhere. So it's things like the telephones, the copiers, the City Hall janitorial, all the different memberships that we have, um, the network expenses, the postage for the Brisbane Star, cable programming, um, copier rental, and then some of the special things like the city share of the Crocker Park shuttle and holiday lunch. Just a bunch of just categories that are not well caught anyplace else. Um, so there's no big changes in this budget over the past year. Okay. Um, council questions? Lori, we'll start with you. I don't have any questions. Ray? Uh, yeah. Uh, I had originally had two thoughts, and one's already been taken care of when we had the discussion on where you put the money for the history book. Um, but I had a second question, and, and that has to do with... Uh, Planning Commission programming. Uh, I'm assuming uh, that's television. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the thought that I had was that we might want, and I think we discussed this before, we might want to consider having an actual um, staff person, a TV staff person, uh, function as they do at a council meeting. Uh, for the Planning Commission when they're holding the public meetings on the draft EIR slash FEIR. And I think we were talking about having some uh, legal support during that time, and maybe it makes sense uh, to have a, a, a better kind of, of TV uh, production because, you know, just the general overview uh, doesn't necessarily work too well. And then People are having you know, public hearing, people trying to talk about things. It, sometimes it's fairly dark. Sometimes the, you know, the, the, the technical things are a problem. So, uh, so I'm just raising the issue, I guess, with you all and with my colleagues as to maybe we should put a little money in the budget for that purpose. Yeah, I, I think it's worthwhile for sure. Uh, What are we? Uh... So here's a thought. Okay. Um, if it's specifically for the draft DIR mm -hmm. and that project for both attorney time and for cable broadcasting time, mm -hmm. that I think that might be chargeable to the developer. Mm -hmm. So it would not be part of the budget. Mm -hmm. It would just be a reimbursement from the developer's deposit. Mm -hmm. Okay. We like your thinking. <laughs> <laughs> You know, keep that in mind and plan accordingly. Okay. I just saved Anything myself else? a few thousand dollars. <laughs> Anything else? No, nope, okay. that's it. Okay. Terry? No questions. Cliff? No, yep, I'm fine. David, you're up. Mayor and Council, good evening. I'm here to present the departmental breakout budget for the city attorney's office. There are uh, six main areas that the city attorney's office handles for the, for the city, starting with attending council and subcommittee meetings, uh, such as council budget meetings. Uh, advise council on legal issues. Uh, as you know, there are many issues that come up uh, that affect the city that require legal advice. I work very closely with the city manager, city department heads, and staff on other legal issues uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. We develop the ordinances and resolutions, both the, uh, the drafting and working with the subcommittees to finalize those ordinances and resolutions. Uh, we represent the city in litigation and administrative hearings and also uh, review all city documents for legal compliance. 
So those are the major areas of the city attorney's office. Uh, one thing you will notice in terms of, of the budget is that in the, the, the prior arrangement with the city attorney, there was uh, a salary and then benefits. And because of the new relationship with our firm, uh, we do not have any benefits or, or salary or retirement. So the, the budget is entirely for the, the fees uh, that are through the contract with the, the Reading Sloan firm rather than the other breakdowns from the, the prior arrangement. So that concludes the presentation and happy to answer any questions. Council questions, Cliff, we'll start with you. Um, well, that was the only question I had, you know, just having that explanation in, the, in your budget here. So, um, you know, prior to, to hiring you on as our city attorney, David, you know, we did have professional services. <laughs> um, so in the budget, what is the professional services breakdown for your firm uh, and what's uh, allocated for other things perhaps that your firm wouldn't uh, provide. You have kind of a rough idea about that. The professional services category is, is really everything. Is so, a catch-all of all? Yeah. Y yes. Okay. So, I mean, any kind of legal services, whether it's uh, labor and employment, whether it's uh, litigation, whether it's general counsel services, all would come within that general, uh, the, the professional services uh, area rather than being broken out in separate areas. Yeah. You know, just in the past, you know, you'd have, you know, with, with Hal's, um, you know, breakdown, he'd be in the, the part-time salaries. And then you'd have the professional services. Right. And you could see, okay, here's, a, here, here's the breakdown. And now we're just having all lumped into one. So maybe I can help a little bit there. So a lot of the professional services that was in the city attorney's budget when Hal was here was for items that were still done by his firm but wasn't done specifically by Hal. So we had, I'm forgetting his name, Steve. Steve Baird would look at our code enforcement issues and, and look and other things like that. So that would be part, that would be those professional services. Um, also, we are using David's firm for, you know, as Maria said, we're using them for the personnel regulations, whereas before we would have gone to an out, a different firm. So we're doing a lot more with David's firm than we had done with, you know, Hal's firm. Because David's firm, as one of the reasons you picked him, was he's got a, they've got a broader bench sure. than Hal's firm did. So this 200000 represents really pretty much paying David's firm. Got it. All right. Thank you. That's it, Terry. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Terry? So um, since you're new on board, we don't have a whole bunch of historical data. Do you know if you're currently, and this may be a question for you, it may be a question for Stuart if we are still in budget for what we budgeted last year um, and so you anticipate no substantial change in your budget for this year are you asking is it going to go over the, the, the 190,000 for this year or the 200,000 for this year correct yeah. correct because we don't have historical yeah. data yet yeah based on the 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 number of, of bills that, have, that we've looked at and the amount of, of hours that have been spent on, on city business, I think that it's probably fair to say that there would in the future be the need to have some adjustment of that, of that figure. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of action activity this year in a number of different areas, and that has resulted in uh, perhaps some months a heavier usage of, of time than, than anticipated. So I, I do think that it's likely that there would be a, a mid-year budget adjustment when there is more data, uh, but I, I couldn't represent that that would be the, the absolute limit for the, for the year. But you're comfortable with that 200000 at this point? For, for the time being, yes. Okay. And, and when we have outside counsel where we, for the um, draft EIR, we've had some outside counsel and some 
other information that right. comes under a different portion of the budget not into the city Th that's right that's reimbursement through the developer uh, because that's directly attributable to the work on on the project and as a matter of fact mm -hmm. my time i've set up different billing uh tracking systems so that any of my time that is spent on the the draft eir for the Baylands or involving recology is not billed to the city I and mean, it goes through the city but it's direct reimbursement from the from the private developer or the private private business uh, because that time is billable to them directly okay thank you mm -hmm. okay Ray yeah I, I guess the only um, observation I have which is sort of consistent with my colleagues is that I guess in a way I didn't anticipate, though I should have, um, the number of people that you would be relying on, you know, in your firm, uh, and you know that the, there was some person who was doing, you know, the city manager's contract, and, and then there's just other person who was doing the, the massage parlor ordinance, and you know, all of a sudden there's all these other players, and of course the deputy city attorney is even coming to some meetings and so forth. So, um, I guess I would just uh, like to have a feel for, as this proceeds along, you know, you know who, who are the players and what are they doing and, and what percentage of time and, and you know, and you're, it's just like how, you know, we often use, uh, you know, outside counsel. Mm -hmm. Uh, and obviously a lot of what you're doing is essentially the same thing only they're in the firm um, and so but I, I, I keep getting surprised by all of a sudden there's a new person shows up and and anyway I guess I feel that it would be helpful or I'd feel more comfortable having a sense of okay so who are all these players and what are they you know, providing in the way of legal specialization sure and, how do they become a part of the picture of our of our legal package in effect, which gives me a fuller sense of, of right. what we're buying in effect. Yeah. And, and that, that's I would a, appreciate that. Sure. And that's a very fair question. And I think that what we can do is give you kind of a breakdown. I mean, one of the benefits that, that I have with my firm is that the reason that sometimes I'll ask, uh, for example, on the massage ordinance, Ivan to step in is because of the other work that I'm involved with, with the city, uh, in the, the draft EIR review, uh, other issues that, that are going on. I could certainly do the ordinance, but it would take an extra several weeks. And so one of the things that I can do is I can call on uh, an associate who can then do the initial drafting, uh, I think as Lois probably familiar with from, from her time in the, in the firm. And what that does is lets us accomplish a lot more for the city in a much shorter time frame than just putting it on the to-do list and getting to it uh, in, in order uh, after all the other things are done. But very reasonable request, and we'll put together a list and try to describe who, and it's still it's a fairly small, discrete group uh, with expertise in various areas, and that way you'll know when you, you hear from somebody or see somebody who they are and exactly what they're doing. Okay, appreciate yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Laurie? Mm -hmm. So it sounds like um, the the processing through of the Baylands application, you said you you charge that time separately to the developer. Right. So what is the reason then for the increase of $10,000 from one ninety to 200000 Because I, I had thought that was because of the Baylands activity, but... No, it's not. But that wouldn't be the case. Yeah, if not charged the, Balin's, the Balin's work would be far in excess of the, of the ten thousand dollars. <laughs> uh, what would, would it be for the maybe the review of the HR policies or? It it really it's it's probably just it's it's, it's reflective up. of the the amount of work that and and the type of work that has been been going on. I think that there's been probably more involvement this year with subcommittees um, there's been more time spent so I think that the 200,000 is an adjustment that reflects some of the additional work that has been been going on in, in the past year more, more realistically captures that time okay 
And I, I don't recall, but can you tell us what is the the rate? Is it like a, it's a blended rate? It's a what blended it? rate, right? Yeah. My my normal uh, public agency rate is is three twenty five, okay. and we agreed when we contracted uh, based on discussions with the council to <coughs> rather have a blended rate, which is two fifty. Okay. And what that does is substantially discounts uh, the normal public agency rate that, that I would have, uh, and it makes it very easy so that there there's no need to charge that higher rate for my time and then a lower rate perhaps for, right. for an associate. And st since most of the time still comes from me, uh, it actually is to the benefit of, of the city. The other thing that I think we, we discussed briefly in the uh, – the last evaluation and uh, just discussion of what's going on is that we normally have uh, an increase. The firm normally increases rates based on uh, a percentage each January the 1st, but because of the, the strong interest uh, in working with, with Brisbane and an understanding of the financial constraints that we're all working under at this point, uh, the firm is not going to be increasing any of the rates okay. for the 2014-2015 year. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? <clears throat> David, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Stuart, I guess you're back. <clears throat> Parks and Recreation, page 157 uh, to 187. Uh, so there's a lot that Parks and Recreation does. We have uh, worked with the council subcommittee on the budget and we have broken out the programs uh, more this year than we did last year. Last year, if you remember, we included the part-time salaries as part of salaries. This time we've including them in the program budgets themselves. What we talked about with the subcommittee and this subcommittee talked amongst themselves is that these numbers that you're seeing in the budget for the programs are what would be reduced if you were to to eliminate the program or change the program. So these are actually reflective of the direct costs of the program. They don't reflect the overhead. They don't reflect supervisor costs. So this is a more true program budget than you had seen last year. And I think that, you know, that was the direction of the subcommittee. I think it gives you a clearer picture of what items cost. Uh, just to let you know what goes on in the Parks and Recreation Department on a very broad sense because you have all the different programs here but obviously we have the admin where you have the new Nancy Trisha who um, does the having people come in they sign up for classes that would be considered admin we do commission support we do facilities booking we do after school program activities after school activities include different things like the actual care for the kids up at the BES, but we also do a lot of sports programs for the kids after school, which also comes in at youth sports. We have preschool activities. We do camps. We do the summer camp, the winter break camp, the spring break camp. We're also doing a Lego camp. We try and put on different kinds of sports camps during the summer as well for the kids. We have adult sports, so we do basketball. We do softball. We've tried volleyball over the years, and some years it goes, some years it doesn't. We do adult classes. These are always what you see in the activity guide. We do senior classes. We do the senior club support. Support. I guess it's so important that I wanted to say it twice. <laughs> Apologize for that. Uh, that's just a donate. That's just what we give to the senior club. We do money for their trips, and we do money just to support the club for their lunches and things like that. We have the senior drop-in center over at the Sunrise Room where we staff that every day of the Monday through Friday. We have community-wide events that we put on, such as the Brisbane Derby, such as the Day in the Park. Uh, we also do the Festival of Lights. We work with the Open Space and Ecology Committee on their cleanups. We also are the lead for the Lagoon cleanup during the year. We do teen dances uh, that we put on for the Lipman students, we do teen after school activities, and this year we're doing it slightly differently. Now we've tried in the past, we are working with the school district, and we're going to have, we're going to, based on the conversations 
of the two by two committee. We're going to put money, provide money to the school district so that way they can provide after school activities for the kids who are on Lipman. We also work with the library when they need help. This past year, we bought them a 3D printer for their science person. So we work with them as they need help. So you look, you picked your head up. So I'm gonna, do you want me to go on more a little bit about that? Because you picked your head up, I'm just wondering um, on that one. I'm on sorry. The 3D, the 3D printer. Yeah, we I brought did, that this year. I did perk up my head because okay. I was at the library JPA meeting this morning and they said they purchased um, 3D printers for all the libraries. That's interesting because we gave them money for it. So I'll have to get that one clear, cleared up. Uh, okay. <laughs> they, they asked us. us the cute little toys that kids have made and yes. printed on the 3D pr printer. Okay. And so I'm. Now, the, their definition of what the purchasing 3D printers is and our definition might be. I mean, they might say they purchased it because they're the ones who bought it. Right. And we gave them the money. So I'm not quite sure what the definition of purchased means in that case. I guess I'm not either. Yes. Um, sorry. <laughs> lap swim um, at the pool. We do lap swim. We do swim classes. We do recreational swims. Um, within the swim classes, obviously, we do, you know, the for the kids. It's summertime, so you'll see a lot of kids are there now. We also work with the summer camp program and do swim classes for those kids. We also do adult swim classes in the evening, so if anybody wants to learn as an adult, we provide that. We also work with a scuba diving where they rent out a portion of the pool uh, where they teach scuba diving, and that's really cool because they use the bottom half of the pool, and then the lap swimmers can swim on the top half of the pool. And you're laughing at me, but I can tell you it's the weirdest thing when you're swimming in a lane and the guys are underneath you. We also have recreational swim, which is what most people think about about our pool. And we also do special events at the pool where people will rent out the entire pool or rent out lanes or something like that. And this year we're going to try something new. We are going to have, um, in the, during the summer, in the evenings, we're going to try and do therapeutic walking for people. So after the pool has been nicely warmed up during the day, we will leave it open for, I think, an extra hour. Extra hour? He doesn't know. I haven't decided yet. In the evenings to allow people, so we pull the lane lines out, so allow people to walk in the pool. So that's the quick explanation of what goes on in Parks and Recreation. Okay. <clears throat> and then this year, we're also going to repair our signboard printer. So that way we can still have signs being printed. How are they being printed now? Um, it's still being printed, just we need to repair it. Oh. Always preferred the hand-lettered sign. Band-aid on it, yeah. The number of hours that we save, I will tell you. Okay. It's incredible, especially when Russ was not available. And then you had the signs that they ran out of room. <laughs> <laughs> if you remember those. That's how they'd look if I were doing them. Uh, yes, and the number of pieces of paper that have been wasted because you didn't quite get the right lettering spacing right. It's don't save a tree, huh? We're, we're saving more than a tree. Okay. Started. Not as personal, I agree. Lori? Thank you. So have we collected any um, data on how well utilized each of these programs are? We do try and put as much as we can the number of participants who are partaking in the classes. And so the annual users, and it's really a challenge. Um, you know, I'm looking at page 176 and you're talking about the seniors. And this is a conversation that the subcommittee has had and we go back and forth as to how the best to represent users. Is it individual users, unique users? Um, so, you know, and I think we still don't quite have that well done within the department because mm -hmm. you know if you look at something like the sunrise room drop-ins we have a 1368 we don't even you know that's not the number of different seniors that we see but that's the number of when you count them all the time whereas if you have a class where you have six people we'll say six mm -hmm. but that class may go on for a few months so it's really a challenge to figure out what we need what we really mean by users and we're still working on that as a department to try and be more consistent. Mm -hmm. okay. And the question really comes as to what I think the council would like to see us. Is it the number of times we interact with people or is it the individuals who we interact with? 
and it's hard to say what we do. And how, do, how does um, Park and Rec decide what programs will be offered? Um, well, a lot of it is based on input from the community. So if the community has interest in a program, we will try and uh, go out and find uh, people who are willing to put on the program. Uh, you know, there's so one of the things we'll do is if the new pro people are interested in a new program, we'll put a signboard sign up asking okay. for volunteer, asking for uh, teachers. Um, also, Russ and Steve will call other cities to see if there are people in other cities who are interested in working with us. Uh, the challenge is always the numbers of people that we can bring to a program. You know, us bringing, you know, when we have a program that we think is successful, may have five or six people. If you're in South San Francisco and you have a program, it may be 30 people. Hmm. So when you look at a yoga class here versus a yoga class in South San Francisco, we're not going to get as many. So you're not going to get the teachers who can be in South San Francisco or Daly City all the time. Okay. Um, but, you know, we have, you know, at the same time, we've had some really good luck. We've got a really couple of really good people in yoga right now. We've got a very good person in water aerobics. If you talk to the people, they love it. Um, we have somebody who does um, agile aging, you know, and those people who are. So the people who, are, who do our programs are very loyal to the programs. Right. It's just not the large numbers. And the way that we work with our um, contract staff is they get 80% of what's taken in. So that's the percent, and that's a rather high percent mm -hmm. for other cities. But in order to encourage people mm -hmm. to teach here, we do that. Okay. So if you have ideas for programs, we're more than happy to <laughs> try. I mean, we've gone out and looked for people, and sometimes we just can't find anybody interested. In taking the programs? In teaching them. Or in teaching them, okay. And then in taking them as well. Okay. Yeah, a lot of it also probably has to do with the times, maybe. I mean, I know personally when I saw the Zumba class I thought oh that sounds great but it's Monday nights at 6 p.m. or something and that's like probably that. when the teacher wanted to be here yeah <laughs> so um, and I had one other question the um, so under on page 163 um, there's the facilities operations and I noticed that um, it mentions a lot of facilities but it doesn't include um, the tot lot at the Silver Spot Playground, which is something that's recently come up. So if um, the council were to decide that um, any work were to be done at that location, um, would it be able to come out of this, or would it have to come out of a, a different part of the well, budget? we would actually put that in the Public Works Department's budget, um, which is the... Parks and Recreation Facilities Maintenance Budget, which is page 125. So what we look at when we talk about facilities and parking and recreation, it's opening, closing, renting. <coughs> when the Public Works Department looks at it, it's the maintenance. So under on page 126, you'll see they have Silver Spot Nursery School and Playground as one of the facilities that they maintain. But we don't re we don't rent out the silver spot or the the tot lot playground so we don't have it in our facilities that that's day-to-day -day maintenance but what if um, there were to be any replacement of any of the the um, you know the the structures that have we would still budget for it out of public works I mean we don't you know if we were going to redesign the playground we would probably you know maybe use the same kind of process that we used for the community park playground where we get interested users to come in and help us help design it. We might have um, Caroline and Karen Kinzer, the kind of the same method that we used for the skate park where I helped start the process and Karen's taken it over. So, I mean, but the money would probably be budgeted in public works or in capital projects, depending on what the cost of it would be. And the challenge with making some changes there is to make it more ADA accessible. So as you start making changes to what's there already, the sand isn't ADA accessible, so you need to, you know, if you're gonna do some renovation there, you might need to think of a bigger project than just adding an element or two. Yeah, yeah it's something that we, we've talked about at the Health and Safety Subcommittee. And, our, and uh, Teresa Strickler, the, the Assistant City Attorney, was there, and she, I think she's looking into the issue of what would 
trigger the ADA requirement. Um, so, great, thank you. That's all I have. Great. Uh, yeah. A couple of things. Um, I'm on page 186. And this is aquatics pool. Um, we have a number of, of uh, maintenance projects mm -hmm. for the resurfacing and the um, pool deck repair and so forth, uh, some fairly substantial amounts, uh, 180,000. Um, I guess my question is, um, uh, items of this sort, I mean, in, in a way they're maintenance, but in another way they're capital, and so my question comes, how do we decide where we put these kinds of things? Is it just strictly who pays for it, or is there some other kind of criteria we use for putting expenditures of this sort in different categories? Um, so this year what we wanted to do is make sure we just captured all of these deferred maintenance items. So we've put them in the budget. What we would, what we would plan to do in the future is bring back a more comprehensive capital improvement plan and you probably see these kinds of items more in the capital improvement plan going forward. So, I mean, these can be considered capital items as much as, you're right, they could be considered capital items as much as they can be considered, you know, maintenance and deferred maintenance items. Right. The other category that we're going to look at is the whole building maintenance area. Correct. Um, you know, Potentially, you could put it in there too, but I think the the I, I agree with Stuart. The idea is that we'll get a comprehensive list, and then we'll have to decide which categories we want to put them in. What what kind of definition makes the most sense, mm -hmm. and um, and then you know the the bigger issue, of course, is deciding on how we're going to try to fund some of this stuff. Because right. Right. right now, I mean, we're basically doing a, a, a pay as you go uh, annual budgetary um, approach, which is which is okay to a point. But, you know, I think we want to get a more comprehensive sense of what we're going to need to do over the next 5, 10, 20 years. Right. Yeah. Okay, so <coughs> seeing these kind of expenditures vis-a-vis -vis the pool um, in another context. Right, and, yeah. you, and you'll see a lot in the Public Works Department, too. Right. And so what we're doing is we're doing another um, budget presentation specifically on these large projects. So Randy will walk you through. Randy will be here next on Wednesday, right. and so we're going to have what we would call the capital projects, um, and what I call deferred projects, because that's what I called them during the budget overview. Okay. So Randy will be able to be here and just really go a little bit more in depth in what he's got in his capital project, and then these were developed with you know you, working with the engineering department as to potential placeholder kinds of costs. Okay. So we haven't, or have we decided how we're going to? Pay for these? And these are right now they are part of the general fund and this is where we talked about where we are moving you know, I showed you last Monday night that there's about seven hundred and sixty one thousand dollars worth of those deferred types of projects within the general fund. Um, we're making a transfer of six hundred thousand dollars from the liability fund, which covers a portion and then the rest would be coming out of fund balance. And it makes a lot of sense to use fund balance because those are a lot of it was savings as you know, we were talking about during previous times. So we had, you know, some savings, which are one-time revenue sources. You match them to more of the one-time kind of expenditures. Okay. Uh, one other question. Um, this is probably to Clay. Um, I know we, we've also been talking about the Park and Rec Commission you know, creating an annual report in which they address their programs and some evaluation and things that they might want to delete, things they might want to add and so forth. Um, and they were going to work on that uh, at their retreat. Uh, so when are we going to see that, I guess is my question. Well, we did have the um, annual get-together on <clears throat> last Friday and uh, we've talked about a number of those types of issues. Um, I think what we're going to do next is, is staff's going to try to take 
what we heard on Friday and put it in a report format, bring it back to the commission, um, have them take a look at that, edit it, and then we'd re uh, forward it on to the, to the council. Okay. Uh, although I'll give you a sneak preview that there was a significant amount of additions, not a whole lot in the deletion side. <laughs> Well, that's not surprising. No, I don't think yeah. so. <laughs> right. The same thing they told me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we all see needs, right? And yeah. uh, and there are a lot of them out there. Right. But then there's a question of who pays for it and how. <laughs> right. And how how do you how do you fund some of that stuff? Right. Yeah. It it also. I'm just thinking about all the maintenance at the pool. Um, we have to figure out at some point, you know, who's going to be really on top of, of managing all of that. So I assume you're working on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly any time you see a capital or major maintenance item, the Public Works Department will oversee that project. Um, I think you're asking a, a larger question in terms of, you know, the Parks and Recreation Department management. That's that's a different, different issue. But um, in terms of once we've identified things as needing a, a maintenance, uh, Public Works Department will be the one be responsible for carrying that through. Yeah, it's just my observation that, generally speaking, when you when you have someone who specializes in air in an area, like running a pool, mm -hmm. um, that's very helpful to have when you have Public Works people who. You know, they're going to be bringing in contractors and so forth, and, you know, they may not have the expertise in running a pool. So it, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, before we start getting into this heavy maintenance stuff, I think we really need to have a, a real sense of somebody on staff who really understands pool management and can be on top of all the things as they get interrelated, which, of course, we know they will be. That makes sense? Um, yeah. In terms of the the pool, the retiling the pool and stuff, yeah, right. yeah. Right. No, I mean I'm certain we'll 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 bring in the appropriate people to provide advice to us on the on the pool on you know the or ma major maintenance projects with community or uh, municipal pools. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's it, <laughs> Terry. Um, before, before we go, um, we're actually uh, 1035, so uh, can I entertain a motion to extend the meeting to, what do you think, uh, maybe 11? All right, so I'll move. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, sorry, Terry, go ahead. That's okay. Um, my question was, again, on page 186 <laughs> with the pool resurfacing and replastering, and it, it uh, I didn't want to interrupt but it sort of goes with how we were defining where that cost should go <laughs> with what Council Member Lou brought up about the tot lot and refurbishing it, where that would go into a capital project or into public works, and this is going here. Um, and I'm not sure if that makes it clear as mud, uh, <laughs> as we'd want to say, or it just sort of shows that the pool does cost a lot of money. Um, and putting it in this budget is so that we can show that pool maintenance costs a lot of money and that it's a big part of our park and recreation budget. Um, that was again, a thought. It, it should almost be captured in that capital budget, and I don't want to belabor the point because whether it's here or there, it's money that's going out and needs to go out to maintain what we have. So that was my biggest right. comment. Um, and it, it makes it a little more difficult looking at how the budget is configured because we've changed things over the last few years. So where it looks like we haven't had any expenses, we certainly are having them now because we're reallocating. Right, and I think this is really a lot of what Ron was talking about as well. When they set money aside every year for their equipment, like their turnouts and their hoses, um, and then I think that's what, you know, when we talk to the budget and subcommittee about it, is that all the departments probably should be 
allocated a cost for repairing their facilities. So that way you don't see any large cost in any one year for something like this, but you see an ongoing cost. Because we really do want to, you know, this is something the subcommittee has talked about, you really do want to capture the cost of the park, parks and recreation programs in those programs where the costs are being, are happening. So yeah, I, I agree with you. It's We're still in a transitional budget in those kinds of issues. And I, and I think that, again, where we have our even sliced pies. This is a hard one where we would to say where we are, but I understand. But, you know, I mean, I think it could be a little bit more clear where mm -hmm. we're, you know, certainly teen dances don't cost what As, right. recreational swim costs. True. So I think that's where we could be a little bit yep. more proportional okay. for the <clears throat> The public information. Thank you. Proof. Thank you, Clark. Um, <coughs> so we have a lot of data here. You know, uh, over the last year or so, we've asked uh, asked you guys to really look at Park and Rec and try and identify costs and, and you, know, from, you know so many different levels. Um, you know, so then how do we? How do we then take this data, you know, kind of look at what we've also have um, uh, proposed, you know, looking at priority-based budgeting, and so how, how do we, you know, what's your recommendation, Stuart? I'm gonna put you on the spot, you know, to take, you know, these. Could you say you don't want to put me on the spot? Well, you know, okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Know, I mean, to take these costs, and and then you know, how do we you know, create a. a some kind of criteria or priority list that then you know identifies importance and, and impact and things like that. Um, thanks for not wanting to put me on the spot. I appreciate that. Uh, I'll come back to you. Uh, I think the answer is is there, 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 as we talked about in the subcommittee. There's there's really a few things that when we're talking about priority based budgeting. Um, that needs that you need to look at as a community. One of them is, are we doing as a city the things you want us to do? And I think as council members, you get a sense from your constituents on a day-to-day -day basis, and probably more so being in a Brisbane than being in a city like San Francisco. So you get a sense, or are we providing the right types of services? Um, and if you're getting feedback, that there are some services that you that are being provided that the community doesn't want or doesn't feel we should be doing I think you'd have a real immediate feedback on that um, when you try then to explain why do we do these things you then start getting into issues like you know we're trying to provide support to all aspects of the community um, this is something that the Parks and Recreation I think Commission is, gonna, is working on is saying you know who are we serving are we serving the right segments of, of our community. Um, you know, you look at police, you know, is that really something that, you know, is, who are they serving? Are we serving the right segments? Are we doing it in the right way? And I, so there's a few, so part of the priority-based budgeting is just the politics of what you hear day to day on, as council members. Um, I think when you start, then you next side you look at is what does our ability to, pro, to continue to provide these services look like going forward and that's why I try and give you a five-year projection and that's why when we start having issues we try and give you as much of a warning as possible as we walk walked through the reserves you know we do have enough reserves to carry us for a few years to be able to make um, those good decisions so that's another question you look like so if we're comfortable with the services we're providing um, and we have the ability even during a recession to provide them for a couple of years you know the question then comes okay we're still doing a good job. Then when you hit the big recession like we hit last time, you know, part of it is you look at what's, you know, and I think the council did it, saying what are, where are those areas where we're serving the community directly? Um, we want to maintain those. Where are the areas that, you know, we can, due to lack of, um, due to people not building as much, we could reduce our staff in the planning department due to, 
Um, we can still make all of our patrols. We can't quite make a lot of our extra stuff in the police department. So, I mean, I think you've done, you know, based on what budgets you've approved, you've done those kinds of priority-based budgeting. It may not be as directly. And then I think the last step is if we get beyond even what we were able to do with that, then you start looking at and, and you do say, what are the segments as a community we want to provide for? Do we want to make sure that at least the seniors have some place to go during the day? Do we want to make sure that the kids have some place to go during the day? Do we want to make sure that we're able to provide a fire department, be able to provide a police department? Um, how that is provided, we don't know yet. But are those the kinds of things that you want to do as a council, as a community? And then you start asking staff, how do we be able to afford doing these kinds of programs? Um, you know, and you look at my, the other city I'm working for at the moment, Half Moon Bay, when they said, you know, we want to provide police, well, they're providing it through the sheriff's department because it's saving them a million dollars from what their old budget was. And we looked at it during that period, during, our, during the recession, and we had reduced our staff to the point where we weren't going to save any money by moving to the sheriff because we've already found our bottom that we could survive with, and the sheriff couldn't do it cheaper than that. So I think those are the kind, you know, I think a lot of your priorities come from the conversations that you have amongst yourselves. How, how do you formalize that? You know, we've been, you know, the subcommittee has been talking about how to make that formal for a year and a half. And it's a difficult conversation because part of how you formalize it changes, you know, people will look at what is important and how do I fit what I think is important into the priority, whether no matter what you call the priority. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, at the moment we can be thankful that we don't need to worry about it too much. Um, but, I, you know, I think still that as a council and as a community, working through that process will help future, you know, help us during future times of when times are good, what do we want to add? When times are bad, what do we want to, you know, subtract? Um, I just, you know, I, th I think it's just going to take more time to really understand the implication of the priorities that we put out there. Because it's, you know, when I was listening to the council the last couple of years, the concern is that if we put a really strict priority out there and what we think, what we know is good for the community doesn't fit within that priority, then the priority doesn't make sense. And I think that's the bigger concern, is that we'll come in with a very bureaucratic rule and it doesn't fit the community. And that was a very broad, long answer to tell you absolutely nothing. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it, it, it was good. I mean, you, you touched on a lot of a lot of good points, Stuart. I mean, uh, you know, there's times when, yeah, the economy is good and, and you know, and we have this money, and, and so we, we've talked about things like uh, resurfacing the pool, and we've talked about an economic development person. It's like, okay, well, why, why would we, you know, spend that money? And, 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 and there's, 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 you, got, you have to be able to come up with the reason. Of course, you can come up with the reason, but, you know. And that's why there's five, or five of you, and that's why you have the community. I mean, the reason we resurfaced the pool, I think it was, as we've talked about, we want to maintain the facilities that we have. Um, you know, when you talk about economic development, there's reasons that were articulated. You know, you want to make sure that during the next recession, we have an understanding of what's going on with the businesses. We want to make sure that the, you know, we want to have a proactive ability to attract businesses so when we, we so we can talk to building owners and people who rent out the buildings and say here's the kinds of businesses we want and then we can go potentially help <clears throat> them bring those in so i mean i think you articulate as you as you go through the process of the budget you articulate the reasons that you have and as i'm just saying is when you try and put them into really strict priorities i think you lose that communication amongst yourselves and amongst the community, you know, I, I think I think you're right about that. Um, you know, uh, the priority-based budgeting that, that we have talked about, um, I don't think is, I don't think it was ever intended to be. You know, like you put it in a box and there's no, there's you know, like a straitjacket and you can you can have flexibility with it. It was really more identifying. You know, what are the things that are important 
to the community? And then how do you make sure that the things that you are providing you know, fit into that criteria of things that you like or that you think that are important based on whatever type of criteria? And so, you know, then moving forward with things that, that are new or when the next recession hits. And, and you're right, you know, when the last recession happened, we as a council made, made decisions. However, you know, a lot of those decisions were made easier for us because people retired. And so then certain things were, were shifted and then it just kind of worked out the way that it did. Um, of course, not, not taking anything away from, from staff and the council with the guidance that was, that was given. But, you know, maybe perhaps when the next recession hits and, and people aren't retiring for, you know, some time, then, it, you know, decisions to cut things might, might uh, be more difficult to right. make. So, um, I'll, I'll, let me just respond, and I'll try and do it quickly. You're back into one of my areas. So you're right. When the recession hit, people retired, but there was very conscious decisions on which positions to fill, which positions not to fill, and how to rearrange staff to meet the criteria to meet the needs of the community. So you know, just because we lost a position doesn't mean that staff did not think about what that position did and how else we could how else we could do that work. So I think that's one of the things that will happen. Um, and I think you know when you are trying to do trying to do priority based budgeting, it's easier to do it if you know that everything you're doing is going to continue. Yes. And what you can do then is say, okay, what are we doing? How, are, how does what we're doing fit into priorities at this point? How do we define those priorities at this point? But I will tell you, the priorities you have in 2014 may be really different than the priorities you have in 2016. Something may happen that changes your priorities. We may get a new technology. There may be a new business that comes in. There may be a business that leaves, and your priorities might change. And so you don't want to create a system where you're saying, okay, what was good in 2014, we're going to continue to do in 2018. I mean, I think that's where we get into the trap of priority-based budgeting. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I think if you're, you know, if you, you look at a certain type of, um, say, you, just, you, know, you call out lap swimming, Right, and say, okay, this is a, a, a priority because it's, you know, I think if you're thirty people come into the audience, you're identifying the, the actual thing that you're doing as a priority, as opposed to looking at, uh, you know, something such as, you know, it's important that we provide services that um, that reach out to a broad base of of uh, sectors of our community that that's important you know or that you know we look at um, uh, you know that that um, you know are there services that that pretty much pay for themselves that might be a curtain I mean those those types of, of priorities I, I think you know are they, they're not like things that um, I think go out of out of out of fashion no, you're right and but I really think that as you're going through it the challenge is people are looking at what you're going to take away because you're doing the priority. And what you'll get is people in the audience who are very devoted to that. I mean, when we were talking about potentially closing the pool in the evenings for lap swimming, you know, the numbers show we get about 10 to 15 people who swim at night. Six of them showed up because they're very dedicated swimmers. Or if you're going to, you know, look at, saying we're not going to do um, mommy and me um, singing. You're going to have 20 people here who are very dedicated to that. <laughs> and, and, I mean, those are the kinds of and, – and those – you don't want to create a system where you look at those people and say, you're because this is what they will hear, you're not important. Enough. Enough. No, well, they'll hear it as you're not important. I mean, you might say you're not, you know, that there's higher priorities for the community. You know, we're trying to serve everybody. But what people in the audience will hear is, you know, you don't, I'm not important enough for you to do this for. And how do you deal, you know, and as a, you know, as long as you have a budget that you feel that you are 
doing the best you can and that you as a council can come. This is why there's five of you who have different opinions, who represent different aspects of the community. Say, yeah, this is a budget that we as a council could support. I think you're, I mean, you do priority based budgeting all the time based on that. It's just not written down in the same way. I get it. I mean, it's, it's that challenge of, you know, how do you put something in writing that you still keep flexible enough that you can deal with changes? It's the reason why we put $100,000 for one-time projects in the budget, because you want to have enough flexibility that when the next good idea comes forward to you, you have it in your budget already. And I've taken up more than enough. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I think, yeah, I think yeah, you yeah. beat this one to death. The, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, between the two of you. So, Cliff, you have any more? Or no, questions? no, I'm good. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll continue in the subcommittee meeting. I, I have hopefully two quick items. I, I missed the part about Senior Club, why that mount went up on page 174. Um, I mean, Almost doubled. It's an amount that we kind of subsidize the senior club. Or they oh, because it includes the part-time person for the senior oh, okay. um, sunrise room. Because right. we put part-time people in now. That's not the drop-in one. Oh wait, no, that is. I got drop, sunrise drop-ins. I'll have to check. Maybe that one will come down, or that could be the staff time working with at lunch. Okay. Because we do have staff people who go to lunches with them. Yeah, I, I'm. Yeah, I wasn't clear on that. Right. I, I'll check. Okay. On, on the seniors' activities, mm -hmm. we have staff go to lunch? With well, them? yeah, we, we, we always have, you know, when they do the staff, the, the Wednesday lunch, there's always staff present at those. You're, you're talking about Russ. Well, no, I'm also talking about Teresa's there, and we open and close the building for them. Okay, but there, there are people who, from staff, that go there that that's not part of. If I show up there, right? No, it wouldn't be you. It wouldn't be me. It wouldn't be Caroline. It would be the person who has to open and close the building. It would be Teresa, who spends, you know, who who's there as part of staff to be with the seniors. Russ is actually taken care of as an overhead person. Yeah. And Russ often fixes the meals for them. Right, but he's not counted in this. But we do have to open and close the building for them. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious what the breakout was because it's different than what it right. was, and it didn't. And I can check anywhere. Okay. Um, the second thing is under uh, team team programming. I know that um, Cliff and I, as a two by two subcommittee, were working with um, Lipman that, uh, that they're making a proposal on doing <clears throat> some teen activities that covers twelve through fourteen, basically sixth through eighth grade, and. Um, what we don't really cover, and we know that we kind of miss this, is um, high schoolers, the 14 through 18, or 13 through 18 age group. And I know that uh, recently we have a new program that started in town. It's not a new program, it's an old program, and that's the Sea Scouts. And we have uh, what's called the Ship 50 which are now located in Brisbane, and they've worked with staff. Um, they've got two boats out at the marina, and um, uh, Randy's working with them to provide some space upstairs in the uh, harbor master office where they can have their meetings. And uh, I've actually, myself, have become quite fond of the program, and I'm going to attend their presentation to Lipman school students tomorrow at 1 p.m. Um, to basically lay out their do a, lay out their program, and uh, I was hoping that uh, when they kind of finally get their legs back on land, so to speak, that uh, they'll start posting colors for us and stuff like that at council meetings. I remember mean, years ago we had had that done, <laughs> um, but they're woefully unfunded. Uh, or underfunded. And I know um, their costs are about $15,000 a year. And so um, the parents have kind of been doing what they can to support it, you know, and come out, you know, with some fundraisers and 
and the whole program stems around boater safety, like uh, teaching kids how to sail, how to uh, row, how to uh, safely motorize, uh, use motorized boats, uh, how to work on them, maintain them, uh, and also leadership. It's a leadership program. And uh, what I'd like to ask is that we do a two-year pilot uh, of helping with some funding of $5,000 per year um, that they could use towards their program. And uh, I talked to Clay about this, and it seems like uh, he agrees with me that uh, it's a good uh, program that, you know, that we can provide some funds for that uh, could kind of address some of our the teen issues, which we don't really have any programs for, you know, and uh, I think it's a great program, and I'm, I'm excited about it being in Brisbane, and uh, I know today they've been working on doing their fundraising um, just to get a shed, a 10 by 20 shed that Randy gave them a location, Marina, it's going to cost about 5500 but they have raised over a thousand dollars and the Brisbane Lions gave them a, a matching grant of a thousand dollars so you know they're not quite halfway there uh, to get that but uh, that's the store equipment uh, stuff that they use to uh, uh, work on the boats but also training equipment and everything like that and, uh, to me it's a, a a great addition to our marina and to our community and I, I'd really like to support them and see if they can really get off the ground, so to speak, and into the water. And uh, uh, I think the best way is to do it uh, $5,000, you know, to help them on their way. So, and I'm asking my colleagues this, if you agree with that, if or if you're okay with it. Because I think staff's okay with it. I'm okay with it, especially if it's for both male and female. It is. It is, and it addresses, uh, I think, their age group is 13 through 21. Okay. Yeah. And it's for both male and female. Is Kit the person leading that? Yes. Okay. And I think Kit just recently uh, joined the uh, Yacht Club, too, isn't it? Um, she's been there for over a year, and she did, you know, come to us and talked a bit but um, I haven't a lot of what you're telling me is is new information mm -hmm. um, that I hadn't heard um, originally she had said most of her kids were not from Brisbane but they want to locate it there at the marina and I'm certainly fine with supporting them how we can and <clears throat> would certainly see what we can do for them you know through the yacht club and their accessibility. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so. Okay, Cliff, you good with it? Yeah, no, it seems like a, you know, well, well worth, uh, wor <laughs> worthwhile uh, thing to allocate funds to. So. Uh, I agree, and hopefully uh, we can get more interest from Brisbane youth as well, from yeah. the teenagers in town. Well, they, they have, I think, three or four kids right now that are Lipman graduates that are part of the program so okay um, and one of the uh, um, sea masters is actually from Brisbane so another one from Daly City the uh, Commodore, Commodore I guess we call it I'm not sure of the acronyms and then kid <laughs> <laughs> the nomenclature yeah the name uh, but yeah, I, I find it exciting and really want to see it. So that's something we can put in and do in our resolution. And and would that come out of this part of the budget or special projects? Um, I mean, we could either put it under services. teen activities or the, co or the, or the other one is both sponsorships. sponsorships. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it could just be part of the 22000 at the moment and we see where we are in co-sponsorships. We could do it there or we could do it here and specifically call out you know, sea, uh, sea Scouts. Yeah, well, I was thinking, that, yeah, and you do it under teen services, sure. it, it kind of addresses that, and we drive two years and see where they're at and see how it's going. Sure. We'll add a line item Sea Scouts for 5000 Um, I'm fine with that. I 
do you have a, a question though on the teen budget since we were bringing that up and the $40,000 um, after school activities is is that for um that's for lit that's what I, we would do for Littman that's what Cliff and I were working on in Littman and the two by two and that is is part of what we were talking about allocating for shutting down or not having the teen center yeah. activities there mm -hmm. um, but was it in that kind of dollar amount or was that has that been that increased? was like seventy thousand dollars amount yeah. Yeah. a lesser amount yeah, we this is less money for the teen center. That's why you see the bottom line is less than what it was. And oh, because there was twenty thousand before, as other teen activities was the placeholder, correct? Um, right, but last year we also had part-time staff in yeah. our budget, whereas you know the new model would not be us hiring part-time staff. It would be having the Lippman School provide the activities. What we're doing, what we requested from them is, okay, we'll give you the money, you develop the program, let us bat it around, and then uh, once we come to agreement, here's the, here's the money and make, make it happen. That way we don't have to micromanage it. We just understand what the program is. And that way, you know, they manage it and the kids stay on campus and hopefully make it a dynamic program. It's kind of the same thing like with Seek Outs. Okay, you got your program here will help help you a little bit and then. okay that's that's it that's all i have thank you Stuart. thank you uh you're doing open space in the college last one, one? I, I guess we're <laughs> we're past uh we're at 1104 so i'm okay uh what i'm running out of time okay <laughs> so I've got space. a meeting every night this week, so okay. I'm running out of time. Open right. Space and Ecology, we do community support, sustainability committee support. Uh, we work with the planning department on things like their uh, green building ordinance, uh, open space purchases, vegetation management, special events, and research. Um, nothing exciting has changed in the budget. Any questions? Ray? I have a... Yeah, I knew <laughs> a comment um, I'm wondering whether we should whether it be appropriate to have a placeholder because we know that there are two properties that have been uh, under consideration um, in the Brisbane Acres and um, that would be uh, open space would come essentially the city's role in that would come from the open space fund and uh, at least there would be a certain amount that the city would have to come up uh, depending upon whether we get help from elsewhere um, that being the case um, I'm wondering if uh, because it also involves uh, other entities aspects, um, management as well as uh, purchase of property I'm wondering if a placeholder would be appropriate something like forty thousand okay. dollars for the purchase mm -hmm. um, yeah I mean I think we could probably put eighty thousand in there because that's probably going to be the city share mm -hmm. assuming that we're successful with the coastal conservancy right. and I think we will be right you talking about the purchase or the maintenance right per, uh, well the main thing is the purchase Oh, oh, that's okay. the okay. Yeah. Now. Which we, comes under this right, we would, department, right? Yeah, we could put eighty thousand dollars under land. For purchase or land for the purchase. Land purchase, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Go ahead, Cliff. So um so last year we we budgeted um fifty three thousand. This year we're looking at fifty one thousand. Um, 2012-2013 actual um, uh, expenditures for, for salary were, were 32,000 so uh, what's the difference me yeah so um, what do you anticipate you know we'll actually spend for our, our staff person for open space and ecology um, you know she's running a little bit less time than um, Lisa did 
but yeah, I mean, it'll be somewhere close to that fifty-one thousand dollar number. I mean, because it's not just it's just not for the person. So there's also a portion of my time that's been that's in this budget as the lead staff person for open space and ecology. So she's probably closer to the thirty-two thousand dollar number, and I'm probably closer to the you know that other twenty thousand. Okay. All right. So uh, so the the, the amount is. Stayed. Right. We haven't added staff. In fact, I think she's probably four hours less a week than Lisa was. Okay. All right. Well, that's it. I'm just curious to know. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, Entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Stuart. Till Wednesday, right? Till Wednesday. All right. So move. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Adjourn. <laughs>